please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be starting at verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2, we'll be starting at verse 19. And reading to the end of the chapter. This is God's word for us this morning. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. So then, you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and whom the whole building being joined together is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, and whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Father, bless our time in your word this morning. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Think about this. Everyone has an unconventional family member. Call them what you will, odd, crazy, or unique. Everybody's got an Uncle Jimmy and an Aunt Sally, okay? You gotta love them. Here's the big problem. You don't get to choose for them to be a part of your family. You didn't get to choose Uncle Jim and Aunt Sally. They were chosen for you. That's blood. Deal with it. She will always be your aunt whether you want her to be or not. Thankfully, I love all my aunts if they're listening. I don't want them to get mad at me. No matter how different your brother is, he will always be your brother. We do not get to choose who is born into our family. In the same way, we do not get to choose who is born into the family of God. There will be unique, peculiar, and odd people in the family of God, and you may be one of them, and it's okay. You are loved and accepted by God, and the, the family of God's role is or each, each member of God's family, our role is to love and embrace each other. Now, um, a man named D.C. Egner writes this. He said, Every few years my family holds a reunion at a park near Lake Michigan. We don't see one another very often, so we're always amazed at how much the grandchildren have grown or how much the children look like their parents. I look forward to the picnic because I'm reminded that I'm part of a family. Everyone who has trusted Jesus Christ as Savior belongs to God's family. The Apostle Paul said that we are all members of the household of God. We are part of a family that is made up of all believers in Christ. Members of a loving family should be honest about their concerns for one another They can ask about how specific problems or struggles are being handled, and they can confront difficult issues. As believers in Christ, we are to be concerned about other members in the family of God, and sometimes the path to spiritual growth can get pretty rough. So we need to encourage fellow Christians to turn from their sin and live for the Lord. The purpose is always to produce a harmonious family of believers who are doing the work of God and building one another up. What a privilege to be a part of the family of God. Amen? And it's true. We are, we are commanded to, to love one another. I can honestly say I love you all. We are commanded to love each other. Now, you may not like each other. You're not commanded to like people. Some personalities just don't click, rub each other the wrong way, though I think the reason that is, and sometimes that's because of sin and hostility, but other times I think that it's God's way of chiseling us when we have people that rub us the wrong way and it's not, a, a, not of a sinful origin. We have to embrace that and say, okay, maybe this person is teaching me to be more this. Or more patient, right? Do you have people that are teaching you to be patient in your life? So, you don't all have to love like each other, but you have to love each other. You don't have to like me, but you got to love me. You're commanded. So we are commanded to love each other. 
And today we're looking at God's new house. God's new house, or we could even say house is really a metaphor for family. God's new family. And the previous verses we looked at God's new man, God's new humanity, the church. And today we're going to look at four components of God's house. We're going to see all in the family in verse 19. We're going to see the foundation of the house in verse 20. A, we're going to see the cornerstone in the second half of verse 20, and then we're going to see the building blocks in verses 21 to 22. So let's look at first verse 19. All in the family, let's read that part again. So then, you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Now we gave you a little bit of a preview of this last week, so this will be a lot of reinforcement. Paul's drawing an inference from what he's just said in Ephesians 2, 11 to 18. In fact, if you look at verse 12 of chapter 2, Paul says, remember that you were at that time without Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He's saying, so you Gentiles, you were not a part of God's nation. You were not a part of God's kingdom, the nation of Israel. So now the fact that the Gentiles are no longer strangers, the Greek word is xenoi, this is from we get, you ever hear xenophobe, xenophobia, that's being afraid of, um, you know, foreigners and immigrants and things like that. Well, that comes from the Greek word xenoi, which means stranger or a foreigner. Um, but the Gentiles are no longer xenoi, they're no longer strangers and so this is providing a resolution to what Paul previously said. They were strangers to God's covenants. They were strangers to His promise, but not anymore. Christ, Christ, through the cross, Christ tore down the wall. And now you no longer have to become a Jew to become in His kingdom. You simply have to believe in Christ. Strangers is a general term for those who are far away from home. Um, it's often descriptive of travelers or visitors. Foreigners, on the other hand, describes non-citizens who may be living in a certain community, but they are not a, a citizen or an official part of that community. So it's, it's covering the idea of both someone that's far away from their homeland or, or someone and or someone who makes their home in a place in which they are not fully accepted. And that was the Gentiles before God brought them in through Christ. But now he's making it clear, you're fellow citizens. You're fellow citizens. You are citizen citizenship. You could see the word city in there, right? And the Greek word for city is uh, polis. So that's where we get politics. Politics are the things of the city, the things that concern the place where we live. And this is why I said that, of course, politics is relevant to the church because Christ is Lord of all. No, we don't want to be having political rallies, but we are to speak, we ought to have rallies for Christ, and we are to speak His Lordship over all areas of life. So we can't run away from that. Now because Christ has made peace and he broke down the partition, the wall, Gentiles are now fully enfranchised citizens. The Jews and Gentiles are one. The, um, the, the later, well, so he, you'll see here that first he says citizens and then just a, a moment later he says household and commentators debate is are these two ways of saying the same thing in a sense but i think that there is a there's a subtle nuance of a difference and then you know the the citizenship refers more to the wideness of the kingdom and being a part of 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 god's city of god's realm household is a little bit warmer in saying you're not only now citizens you're family Okay, when we think of people becoming citizens 
of our country, that doesn't necessarily connote family. So Paul's saying, not only are you in the nation, now your family. Now, regarding citizenship, it was a source of pride in the ancient world. In the Greco-Roman culture, to which Paul was writing in Ephesus, citizenship was highly personal. One city, or polis, provided one's identity. The city's laws were a part of one's beings. Its custom, a sort of pride. Its inhabitants were one's lifelong friends. And that's true. And that's why the U.S. is having such an identity crisis that other nations don't. All nations are struggling in, in one way or another. But the beautiful thing about the U.S. is that it was for all peoples. But when that starts to get lost and we start to get away from our findings, we're just, we're just a mass clump of different people who have no idea why we're a nation. See, there can be political and turmoil in Italy. And Italy's gone through a lot of... Uh, political turmoil from the kingdoms of Italy to the Mussolini, same with Russia, the Soviet Union and the, uh, that fell and I mean all this stuff and before they had the you know, oligarchs, China's went through a lot but the things that those nations have that we don't is, well, we're Italian or we're Russian. It's, it's that common identity that holds them together. That's why we need something more. And the U.S. doesn't have the answer as much as I'm a patriot because the only thing that can hold peoples together is Christ. And yes, I believe we've had Christian, uh, Christian values and foundations in our country for sure, but it was not Christian enough. Christ, because Christ is the only thing that is going to hold us all together. So I'm not concerned with the U.S. here, though. I am concerned with the church. Because the church is also a nation. A nation of, as we've been saying, all different ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds. The church is for all people groups. And the thing that unifies the church is crystal clear, Christ. Christ unifies us all. We are a culture. And so the Gentiles, they were, they were proud to be Romans or Greeks, and part of this city or that city, but they were far from God. And now Paul is telling them, really, your true citizenship now is in the family of God. And to, and to the Jews even, it was... And, and I'm also speaking to the Jews that your identity is not in your land and in your ethnicity, but in your Messiah, Christ. What does Paul say in Philippians 3.20? But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jew and Gentile believers in Christ have the same destination, a place prepared by Christ to which He would take them, the ultimate polis, the heavenly city. You re remember John 14, 1-6, Jesus says that He's going to take, He's going to come back and take them to where He is, and that He is the way, the truth, and the life. Again, speaking of household, Clinton Arnold says the term is a metaphor for family and expresses the sense of belonging and closeness that is experienced within the bonds of a family. The image was anticipated in the introductory eulogy by Paul's use of the metaphor of adoption in Ephesians 1.5. Jews and Gentiles, men of whatever race or color or class are together of the household of faith, the same family. Galatians 6.10 speaks of the household of faith. Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And obviously that means sons and daughters. Read Galatians 3 to get perspective. Turn in your Bible, put a bookmark in Ephesians, and turn with your Bible for me for a moment to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. 
Israel was God's chosen nation, but they rejected their Redeemer and they suffered the consequences. The kingdom was taken from them and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. This new nation is the church, according to 1 Peter 2.9, a chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. If you look in Matthew 21 and go to, um, I want you to go to verse, let's start at verse 42. Now Jesus talks about the parable of the tenants. And it's a parable in which a landowner rents out his vineyard to some people. He rents it out. He rents out his property, his land, his domain to people. But they rebel against this landowner. They want, to, they want to make it his own. And every time he sends them someone to correct their course, they mistreat them. He even sends them his son, and they kill him. And Jesus said this in verse 42, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God, he's talking to the leaders of Israel, The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone, that's Christ, that's going to become prominent in our message today, will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Now Jesus is is speaking specifically to the leaders of Israel at that time. It was a They were corrupt leaders, and it was an illegitimate regime. They had no business leading the nation. And so Jesus says, I'm taking it away from you, and I'm going to give it to a new nation. And we understand that from Scripture to be the church. Now one day, the Lord is going to restore the nation of Israel, and they are going to function as He designed them. But in this time we live, God is spreading His message through His new nation, the church. We, the church, are God's nation today. We are God's people, Jew and Gentile, black and white, Asian, Italian, Russian, all peoples, no one's excluded. We're one nation, we're one family, all of us in Jesus are brothers and sisters no matter race, nationality, or any physical distinctions we may possess. You know, the world likes to say that we accept all uh, race, color, and creed. They have it all right except the creed part. Because we need something to unify us, and that is our God, who is Jesus Christ. We can love on unbelievers, we can tell them of the love of God, but we cannot have unity with them if they are outside Jesus Christ. Whether believers were previously apart from God and His people or whether they were previously near, they become one in Jesus Christ. Whether they were former strangers and outcasts or former aliens and guests, all believers in Christ become citizens of God's kingdom with the saints. The believers from every age who have trusted in God. God's kingdom has no strangers or aliens, no second-class citizens. We are fellow citizens and fellow family members, John MacArthur says, equal, equal in every spiritual way before God. If God accepts each one of us, how can we not accept each other? He also says, every kingdom citizen is a family member and every family member is a kingdom citizen. They, they're one and the same. And it's not that in Paul's day or in ours, all the Jews were saved. They weren't. And it's not that all the other peoples, the Gentiles, were saved. They weren't. Now one day, the Bible says, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea, and we'll see whole nations come to Christ. But that's not the time we live in. But we see a remnant in each nation, people of, of, of each people group, trusting in Christ. We're getting a preview of that day in the church, this room, 
what we have in here today is a preview of the new heavens and the new earth where all nations will be one in God. We get a preview of that. A number of scriptures here, just sit back and listen. They're, it's from Hebrews 2.11 and Hebrews 3.6, but they're uh, summarized together. Both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. So you see that house, or this metaphor of a building or a temple, points to a reality so much more than brick and stone, but it points to family. Jesus said as we, as we looked some weeks back that the temple would be destroyed, that not one stone would be left in place, and that's exactly what happened. And it, simultaneously with that, Christ begins to build His church living stones, spiritual stones, and He is our elder brother. So what is the foundation here of God's new house? Let's go to our second point. The foundation, verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets. Now in the next verse, Paul is going to say that Jesus is the cornerstone, that he is he is the chief stone of that foundation. But in some sense, the apostles and the prophets are that next level of foundation. So it's as if Christ is the cornerstone foundation and then the apostles and the prophets through their teaching build upon Christ. Christ and they continue his foundation. Um, let's, let's look at this a little. Now, Paul appropriates the image of a build, building to illustrate a further dimension of the new humanity. So just keep in your mind, he's using the metaphor of a building, of a physical house or a physical temple to point to a spiritual reality that we are his temple. And actually, as we see, each one of us is stones in this ever-growing temple. It is a temple built on the foundation of the apostle and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. For a thousand years, the Jerusalem temple, first Solomon's, then Zerubbabel's, and then Herod's, had been the official focus of God's presence and of God's people. And actually starts before that, and, uh, well, let's go even further. I mean, first it was the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had direct access to God, but they sinned and they got expelled. Now, we know that, we, we infer from Scripture that worship continued in some form or fashion after Adam and Eve were asked to leave because of their sin. We can infer this from the fact that Cain and Abel both attempted to uh, worship Yahweh, one rightly and one wrongly. Now, were they, were they offering in some spot close to where the Garden of Eden is? We can only infer. But by the time God starts forming His new nation under Moses, what travels with the people? A big tent called the tabernacle, and the tent was where God met His people. Well, fast-forwarding through a lot, when Israel's finally in the land... King Solomon, who had a glorious start but a horrible end, that's a lesson for us all, builds this beautiful, magnificent temple, and it becomes the place of God's presence. But because Israel was not faithful to Yahweh, that temple's destroyed. Zerubbabel rebuilds it during the time of the exile, but it ends up getting destroyed again. And then Herod builds a temple, and that's the temple that's erected during the time of Jesus. 
And so we've, we've had these three, we, three temples, and that was the focus place of God's presence and of God's people, but that was about to change, which we see in Jesus' word, this thing's going down. You can even see today, just with our, our enamorment with buildings, why the Lord maybe had to do that. I mean, there were many reasons he had to do it, many profound theological reasons, but I'm just thinking of a simple common sense thing. I mean, I'll tell you this. I mean, you know, I, uh, I went to Florence and I saw um, the dome of St. Mary there, and that thing, I mean, it impressed me. It is, it is wow. And could, could, could architectures like that give glory to God? If done rightly, yes. But what happens, as you know, is men start worshiping the architecture. Men start really worshiping cathedrals in and of themselves. And sometimes God has to, to get it well. God has to get our focus off of such enamorment with buildings because we make them an end in their self. But it is very easy to get all caught up in a building. And the temple in Jerusalem at that time was the building, and it was the only temple of the true God in the world. So imagine how great was its fall. Now the Ephesians had their own temple, the temple of Diana, which was a totally pagan, ungodly temple. But some think that Paul knows that and that the Gentiles, many of them would not have reference to Jerusalem, but they would be thinking about the temple of Diana and how great that was. And God says, no, I don't want your, your focus on either one. I mean, one's good, one's bad, but your focus is not to be on one of these buildings. So now, our Kent Hughes right? the new people need a new temple. And a static, geographically grounded one would not be adequate. This new temple would have three elements, a foundation, a cornerstone, and building blocks. Now let me just say this as a real quick aside. I don't have time to get into it. I'm not against buildings. I mean, I, I think we have a very beautiful building. We have a beautiful cross here and a lot of beautiful things. But this building is not the church. We are. We have to keep that in mind. I also want to say this. I'm not against the temple in Jerusalem being physically rebuilt. Because I think it will be. And it's not a bad thing of, uh, in and of itself. But it, it's a matter of focus and emphasis. We believe here that there will be a, a temple rebuilt during the tribulation. This one will be built by the Antichrist, and it will not be a good one. And, and it will deceive many, because he's going to go in there and proclaim to be God. But when Jesus Christ comes and establishes his kingdom, he will yet build another temple. And that will not take away from the spiritual reality that we are his temple, but it will serve a purpose in its place. So, the scriptures are not saying temples are bad, buildings are bad. But it's a matter of, it's a couple things, it's a matter of emphasis, because it was never ultimately about the temple, it was about God, right? We lose focus. And it was also a matter of a change in the way that God was going to get his message and his glory to the world in this age. And in, in, in this age, there is no physical building well, except our churches. And we do, again, not to beat a dead horse, but we, we, we get that mixed up. I mean, how many people you, you think of this building as the church? If, if, if this building were to... Were to in an earthquake, go down. Of course we would be sad, but it's not the church. We're the church. And it's, it's through us, his spiritual temple, that God is getting his message to the world. Okay, so let's go back to this foundation. What's it mean, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about what this means. Is he talking about 
Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and others who certainly preached Christ. They preached Christ um, They preached Christ before Christ came. Look at Isaiah. He was wounded for our transgressions. So I certainly think that sometimes something can be true, but it's not precisely what the text is talking about. So while I think it's, it's definitely true that Old and New Testament prophets are building on the foundation of Christ, I think in this context, as because it's set, and, and most people I've read are leaning this way, because it says apostles and prophets, it's speaking of New Testament prophets. So what's a New Testament prophet? Well, that would be someone like Luke or Mark, who wrote, who wrote, who spoke prophetically and who wrote New Testament books, but were not apostles, but they were still prophets because they spoke words from God. Luke says that the first believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostle, that's in Acts 2.42, the apostles' teaching in those days was the Word of God. There was not a completed New Testament. There was a completed Old Testament, but there was not a completed New Testament. This also helps us understand the oft misunderstood, and that's an understatement, Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus says to Peter, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, there's nothing in all the context of this that, Peter, that Jesus is telling Peter that he's, he's going to be the head of, of the church and that the church is going to be stationed in Rome and that all the leaders that come after him in Rome, they're going to be that rock. It, that, that is not in the text. But we shouldn't shy away from the fact that it calls Peter a rock. That is another way of saying he's a foundation, as Ephesians has just told us in 2.20. So Peter is a rock. You're a living stone in the church. Now, what exactly it means for Peter, we're gonna, we're, this is what we're breaking up, but it's, it's not just Peter, it's all the apostles and all the prophets that form this foundation. Revelation 21.14 confirms this even more, that the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So what we're going to see here is that Christ is the cornerstone. Then it's the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And they are foundational because they preach Christ. And they preach His Word. They were, and again, these are metaphors that are kind of crossing, but they are the foundations in the sense that they are laying the foundation that Christ has given them. They have no right to build upon that foundation anything other than what Christ has commanded them to say or do. You remember 1 Corinthians 3.11? For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So this brings us to to our our third point, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He is, again, the, the apostles and prophets are a foundation, but at the second level. They're building upon the corner foundation of Christ. For hundreds of years, cornerstone was a a. a prophetic designation for the Messiah. The Jews knew this. Listen to Isaiah 28, 16. God says, See, I lay in Zion a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. The one who trusts in this stone will never be condemned. Virtually every Hebrew understood the importance of the cornerstone for it determines the stability of the foundation and the character of the entire building. The Jerusalem temple itself had a huge foundation 
the greatest of which was 29 feet in length. Listen to this. MacArthur says, The cornerstone was the major structural part of ancient buildings. It had to be strong enough to support what was built on it, and it had to be precisely laid because every, part of the stru- every other part of the structure was oriented to it. The cornerstone was the support, the orienter, and the unifier of the entire building. This is what Jesus Christ is to God's kingdom, God's family, and God's building. And by the way, of application. This is what Jesus Christ is to your life. Is He your cornerstone? Answer that question. Is He orienting everything you do? Is He the cornerstone for your family? Is your family built on Him? Is He our cornerstone here at NFBC? May it always be. Christ broke down the wall separating Jews and Gentiles And now he serves as the foundation of a new spiritual building. And it emphasizes Christ Jesus himself. It uses the intensive pronoun to say it's it's our Lord and Savior himself. Yes, the man who became flesh that is the foundation of this new building. Not only does Paul interpret this cornerstone to be Christ, but so does Peter. If you'll turn for a moment to 1 Peter chapter 2. We just, uh, before Pastor Tom moved on, this was, we went through 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, 6-9, to nine, you'll remember these words. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes upon him will not be put to shame. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this stumbling they were also appointed. But you are a chosen family, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. In the early 1990s, um, archaeologists discovered five enormous stones that were a part of the foundation of the Jerusalem temple that was that was destroyed according to Jesus' prophecy. The biggest stone was 55 feet long, 11 feet high, 14 feet wide, and 570 tons. That is a physical picture of just how weighty a foundation Christ is for our lives and our church. The ultimate foundation is Christ. But going back to the apostles and prophets, they lay that foundation through their proclamation of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 17 simultaneously speaks of Paul laying the foundation through his apostolic testimony about Christ and of the foundation consisting of Christ himself. Both 1 Corinthians and Ephesians speak of the temple as constantly expanding and being indwelt by the Spirit. So again, Christ is the foundation and then he gives his apostles and prophets the authority. Remember, they didn't have a completed New Testament at that time. He gives them the authority to speak the word of God directly, to speak new prophecies, to complete his message. And at the end of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, though I think it's talking about Revelation itself, it certainly has application to the entire word of God It says, don't add or take away from what God has revealed. Homer Kent says, in this building, Christ is the cornerstone. This is the significant stone in the building which governs the lines and angles of all others. So in the church, it is Christ himself himself who makes all believers living stones. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter 2, 4-5. 
and Christ governs the place they hold in the building. All believers have become such by virtue of their receiving the word of God, being unified to Christ. Whether a Jew or a Gentile, we are all being added to this holy temple. And then we get to our last point, the building blocks. So Christ is the cornerstone. The apostles and prophets are the foundation. Well, the apostles and prophets, their prophecies and their words from God have been written in the New Testament. So the New Testament is that foundation built upon Christ. And we have the apostles and prophets in the New Testament. And also, this is why I think, again, there is a, 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 um, an, an application here or an understanding here that it would include the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets were guided by Christ as well. So we have the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles and prophets. We have what we need. This is our foundation. So when we say we, we preach the Bible, we are saying we preach Christ. They are one and the same thing. And so the Bible is that foundation upon, that is built upon what Christ said. That is why we do not accept new prophecies today, because the foundation has been laid. But he is building upon it. And this gives us this very strong impression that this temple is still being built. And you and I as believers, as Peter says, we're living stones. We're being built on that foundation. But we have no right to go against the apostles and the prophets. Because if we go against the apostles and the prophets, or if we add to or take away from what the apostles or the prophets said in the Old and New Testament, we are, we are going astray from the foundation of the apostles and prophets that's built on Christ. That's why we don't add new prophecies to the Bible. That's why we do not add new teachings to the Bible. We have everything we need. Let's read verses 21 to 22. And whom the whole building, being joined together, is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, and whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. This, this new temple is not complete. God is still building it. Jesus says, I will build my church. And this is what he's doing. And think about this. The Gentiles who were not allowed into the Jerusalem temple, and remember there was a, there was a sign that separated the, the court of the Gentiles from the inner sanctuary, and there was a sign that said, enter at your own risk. You come in here, you're going to die. Now, God's reaching down and gathering these stones from Death Valley and making them living stones. He's taking these, these that were dead and far away from him and using them now to build his spiritual temple. First Peter, again, in, in chapter 2, 4 and 5, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. So, <clears throat> Christ is the foundational living stone. Then it's the stones of the apostle and prophets, and then it's us. And we have nothing new to add. Our job is to herald this, and to study this, and to be faithful to proclaim the message of this. In whom the whole building, being joined together, uh, this is a, a rare uh, compound word in, in the Greek, but the sense is to fit together, to carefully join every component of a piece of furniture, wall, building, or other structure. It's to, every part is precisely cut to fit snugly, strongly, and beautifully with every other part. So God has... His, his, if you are a believer in Christ or will become one today, 
God, and this goes with the predestination aspect, God's perfectly made you a part of this building. You are not insignificant. Each person of the church is, is a significant aspect. We, we all have a, a place in this. And this is paralleled with, in verse 22, built together. This is to continue this imagery of God carefully building His church and us being a part of it. And again, remember the context, Gentiles. He really is reaching out to Gentiles. Well, this applies to Jews too, but he's reaching out to Gentiles because of the, the alienation that they still struggled with. Is can, I, can we really, you know, we were, we were worshiping the goddess Diana. We were doing this. Can we really be a part of God's family? And he's saying, not only are you a part of the family, a part of the nation, but let me give you a metaphor of a building and to say that he's perfectly placed you in this building. That doesn't mean you're perfect, but he's working on you. Remember, this goes with Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship. So he is, he's putting us on the building and he's chis he's may still be chiseling us and refining us, to use that metaphor. And maybe he uses people you don't like to do that, but embrace that. In the old covenant, God filled the literal temple with his presence, but now he fills us. And this goes with, if you'll go back for a moment to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23, it says, He put all things in subjection under his feet and gave, gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So, God is is working on us and he wants to fill the earth with his glory through us. And how does that start? Well, that starts with reaching your neighbor. This church isn't going to be complete until the day God says it will be complete. MacArthur says Christ's body will not be complete until every person who will believe in him has done so. Every new believer is a new stone in Christ's building, his holy temple. Thus, Paul says the temple is growing because believers are continually being added to it. It talks about, as some of your translations, including mine, might say inner sanctuary. Well, why does it say that? Because there's two words for temple. The general word, hyron, which is, hyron, if I'm saying that right, is, is used to describe the entire temple complex, the outer courts, the at everything, okay? The decorations. Naos was used to describe the inner sanctuary, the special place where God met with his people. So in calling us his temple, God is saying we're the inner sanctuary. And remember, this is significant to Gentiles who were in the outside, the outer courts. He's saying we, we as God's people, are, are the place where God's presence directly meets with earth through those of us who believe in Christ. It talks about dwelling and that carries the idea of a permanent home and God wants to make us His home. He wants His Spirit to live in us forever. Nobody can have any true place in the eternal building of God unless he has found life in Christ. Through regeneration, all believers, whether Jews or Gentiles, have been made recipients of eternal life and have been made a part of that spiritual unity of the church. This true church is God's habitation, His home in this world. For by His Holy Spirit, He dwells in each believer individually and makes Him a part of the one spiritual organism, the church. So, this is, there's an individual application to this. For, for example, 1 Corinthians 3 16 to 17 it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. 2 Corinthians 6 16 also talks about us being a temple. But in these analogies, what we see is that, yes, individually the spirit 
dwells in us, but it's also together. It's a both and. The Holy Spirit builds this temple by taking dead stones out of the pit of sin, giving them life, and setting them lovingly into the temple of God. This temple is fitly framed as the body of this temple is fitly framed together as the body of Christ, so that every part accomplishes the purpose God has in mind. Praise God for what He and His grace has done for sinners. Through Christ, He has raised us from the dead and seated us with Him on the throne. He has reconciled us and set us into His temple. And neither spiritual death nor spiritual distance can defeat the grace of God. So as we come to the end of Ephesians 2, Paul is stressing so strongly unity in Christ. And this is going to be important because in the chapters to come, he's going to talk about the powers of evil that will attack the church. And we have to be unified in him. As we see throughout Ephesians, new Christians need time to grow. So Paul wants to help them understand who they are in Christ, their new community in the church, the new source of power for their growth. And he wants to challenge them to rid themselves of all vices and to walk in the Spirit. So it is natural then to expect that there would be tension and disunity within the new church at various levels. But this is not to be the norm. Paul knows there's going to be trouble, but he wants to strive for the church to know who they are in Christ and to fulfill their mission, to fill the world with his gospel and his glory and his spirit. So just some implications from chapter 2 as a whole. We learned about nearness to God. We learned about a new community, the church. We learned about reconciliation between all peoples and reconciliation to God. We learned about a transition from the old to the new covenant. And I want to give you two things. Are you saved? Have you trusted in this Jesus? Have you trusted in this cornerstone? Have you repented and come to him? And second, are you sharing him with the world? Are you fulfilling this God-given mission? Listen to this little illustration. Um, A commentator, uh, Mr. Powell, writes, He says, I remember a day when I crawled into a mud hut in Central Africa. Seated near the only supporting pole of that strange hut was an aged black man who wondered why I had entered his impoverished home. He could not speak a word of my language and I could not speak a word of his. I folded my legs beneath my body and smiled at him. Then all I said was Jesus and his face immediately became a pool of radiance and in that mysterious fashion known only by Christians we became united in fellowship he was just another man who had been made nigh by the blood of the Savior Father we thank you for your word and I just pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work on us as you're chiseling us you're building us now through the preaching and the proclamation of your word Father, I pray that each one in here would draw closer to Christ today. And I pray for the salvation of any that don't know you. I pray for the salvation of our lost loved ones. Help us as your church to spread and share your glory with the world. It starts with the neighbor. Father, help us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.